Welcome to REA Radio. Enjoy the vibes. Welcome to REA Radio with your host HD and the beautiful Mimi the Actress. No, she doesn't do porn. Tonight's <laughs> guest is an actor who made TV appearances, adult entertainer who appeared in more than 600 adult films, the 2009 Go For Her Feminist Porn Award, AVN Award winner, a candid and exquisite author, to now a 2021 AVN Hall of Fame inductee. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, Mr. Tyler Knight. Confetti and balloons drop from the ceiling. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what sounds to make. And the crowd goes wild. That's wrestling, but I, okay. Thanks for the introduction. That was a great no, no. introduction. Thank you. Thank you for, and it's a pleasure just having you on our first segment of REA Radio After Dark. Um, you are a man of many trades. Um, I know you have a impressive resume. Um, into martial arts, boxing, run for, running for marathons. I believe exotic dancer. Correct me uh, if I'm wrong. No, actually, funny enough, I'm a little bit too shy for exotic dancing. Oh. Okay. <laughs> You got to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> you have well, to. <laughs> well, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty simple. There's no pause button. There's no edit button. You're, you're live and that's it. You know, you make a mistake, you own it. You know, at least when you're doing filmed entertainment, you're not interacting directly with the audience. The audience only sees your finished product after it's been edited and, you know, all that good stuff. So that's true. All right. Well, there we have it. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit of your upbringing, your background story? Like, were you born and raised in like um, your childhood and adolescence? What was it like? So the uh, superhero origin story, I take this. All right. So I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And parents moved us to the suburbs in New Jersey right after, you know, they both graduated from college. And all those things you listed and ticked off is probably a, probably a direct result of the fact that I was the only black kid and I had to be smarter and faster, stronger, better than everyone else around me. So, you know, maybe it's overcompensating. Interesting. Interesting. Mimi? Um, I actually want to know what were you doing before you got into the industry? Okay, so I did my first scene in the adult film industry when I was 32. And interestingly enough, before that, I was actually a mainstream model, like a real, like take pictures with clothes on. That's the whole point of actually photographing clothes and stuff. And it was towards the end of my career, I was, I was turning the ripe old age of like 30. And my agent sent me on a gig that... Uh, you know, you normally wouldn't take if your career was still on the upswing. And basically it was a new layout for a magazine, I think it's now defunct, called Women's Forum or Australian Women's Forum. And, you know, that kind of planted a light bulb in my head a little bit. Uh, but yeah, before, the, before I was uh, in the adult film industry, I was uh, mostly a print model and I was a stockbroker for a while before that as well. Just normal, boring stuff. What? Um, how did you get into stockbroking? Or was that something you went to school for? No, actually, I went to school for something that is completely useless. I studied art, uh, <laughs> which... which <laughs> it's, it's not useless. That's not useless. Different if, forms of art now. That's right. true. You get the, that's a whole other conversation about how our society doesn't value the arts as much as it does as STEM, which obviously science, technology, engineering, mathematics is obviously important, obviously. Mm -hmm. But there's such a low value and premium placed on people studying the arts that your family members come to visit you one by one as if you're in a casket and it's awake and they're, and they're basically uh, mem memorialized in the end of your life as you know it. Mm -hmm. um, but there you can have a future and I'm living proof like years later I'm writing books so there you go Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. but but yeah to answer your question um, to answer your question it's really a function of really a function of life being too short 
and trying different things until you find something that you click with. I mean, most adults, they change their, not their jobs, but their careers 12 times in their lifetime. So, mm-hmm. you know, life is way too short to not try something because of what someone else thinks, uh, whether it's art or taking your clothes off or whatever it is, you know, twerking on TikTok, doesn't matter. <laughs> Do you, make you happy. <laughs> um. So what, like going from modeling to um, the adult film industry, was there something in particular that kind of swayed you to go that route? Like you go from being a print model, as you called it, with clothes on. Um, (laughs) Is that something that really swayed you to just like go there? Uh, Yeah, money. My (laughs) Well... (laughs) My agent at the time took off with uh, with uh, all the bookings and all the earnings of not just me, but all the models across the board. Um, so most times, most times when a client pays you, like say you do a photo shoot for for Cross Colors Jeans, which I'm aging myself because I actually did a photo shoot for Cross Colors Jeans. Um, so the client actually pays your pays your agent directly, and you know your agent pays you met, minus their their 10% or whatever. So the agent basically absconded with not just my money, but the money of all the agents, all the models on their board, they're representing. And my rent was due. And I was in the Hollywood library, just trying to find a job or whatever in the, in the paper. This is back when newspapers actually existed. (laughs) And uh, some dude comes running across the street Cars going both directions, and he's uh, he's screaming, "Hey, stop, stop!" <laughs> and I'm like, "What? What's up?" And he's like, "Hey, have you ever thought of making movies?" And I knew right away exactly what kind of movies he was talking about. <laughs> but I still asked. I said, "What kind of movies?" And he says, "I think you know." I said, "Nah, man, I'm cool. Um, no offense, but I'm heterosexual, and I, I just, you know, it just doesn't appeal to me." He says, "Okay, well, no worries. I I have some friends in the uh, in the street side of the adult film industry, and you can do really well." So I took his business card and that was it. He goes running back across traffic, zipping both ways, whatever, like he was in the matrix. And uh, I put his card on my mantle above my fireplace. And I must've stared at it for like two weeks until I was really getting desperate because you know, I had no prospects for work whatsoever. And I called and an HIV test later. And I was on a set in my first film, which of course I failed and bombed miserably because I could not perform. It was very, very, very humbling. You can be the big, biggest stud in the world, um, have all the girlfriends like basically genuflect and write poetry to how great you are in bed, but you are mm-hmm. nothing until you try to perform in front of 30 strangers all staring at you under a time clock clicking, not ticking. And uh, mm-hmm. I failed miserably, which is great because I guess I need to get taken down a couple hundred pegs. <laughs> Uh, here's my question to you how did you before the porn and all all that um how did you make a cameo on sister sister oh yeah so when i was when i was uh a model my agent sent me on an an audition for uh sent me on auditions for like real acting stuff and that was one of them and they just wanted some guy to basically say a couple of words and smile and be a me puppet but by the time it was done, I was just basically stay, I was basically smiling, being a meat puppet. They cut out all the dialogue stuff. So <laughs> it's all good, though. Interesting. Interesting. It's a lot of fun, though. Mm. How long did it take you to just film that, that, just that one um, portion of the um, episode? About an afternoon, maybe four or five hours. Okay. A lot of it sitting around and waiting for, uh, you know, lights and all that stuff, you know, mm-hmm. rehearsals. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Okay. and tomorrow, awesome. Wow. That's what's up. Shout out to them. Hmm. Shout out to the Murray twins. Um, I do want to go back to uh so your story about like getting into the industry and you said um one so you had to get tested, uh, and then you go and well how that what is the process for that? So so there used to be a center called AIM or Adult Industry Medical, which they're now defunct. 
mm-hmm. and they would be the one central database where they would test all the all the porn talent and storing the database basically results from not just HIV but gonorrhea and chlamydia um, and you would basically go in get your blood drawn pee in a cup that kind of thing and you would get your results turned around just usually within 24 hours and it's a PCR PCR DNA test so it's much much more accurate and obviously much more expensive than um, you know other tests which interestingly enough th- th- those are the same kind of tests that are being done right now for COVID-19 PCR DNA it doesn't test whether or not you it's basically tests for the presence of antibodies so it's out, it's, oh, it's right. outstanding Interesting. And um, you get a you get a piece of paper and you carry that piece of paper with a raised seal on it, and uh, you go from set to set, basically showing your piece of paper. The test at those days, the test was good for a month, which obviously you can see how problematic that was. Uh, nowadays, the window's been shortened to the test being valid for two weeks. If I had my way, the test would only be valid for maybe a week at the most, three days in the three days minimum. Nowadays, we're testing for COVID nineteen, and that's a three day test, which is idiotic because obviously anything can happen within three days. That should be a daily test, full stop. Um, but that's that's that. I agree. I agree. Um, Hector, do you have a question? Or got into I would like to ask. Well, all right, Tyler. So we're gonna stroke your ego just a little bit. Um, how is Tyler Knight uniquely different from other porn actors during that time? Uh, cause I'm uniquely me. I mean, look, the world has, the world has their own example of, uh, Lexington Steel or Mr. Marcus or whatever. There's only one me for better, or for worse. This is what you get. And that goes for anyone doing any, anything in life or any endeavor, be the best version of you. You can be, uh, that's what you have to offer the world is who you are as a human being, how, you know, how, how you interpret the, the human condition. And, and, you know, that's, that's one thing that's uniquely you. And that's one thing that you can offer to world. whether you're a carpenter or, or a porn actor, or whether you're, uh, you know, a, I don't know, a, a surgeon or whatever. Your time on earth is a record of, is a record of how you perceived humanity. And, um, you know, don't try to be anyone else, be you. Absolutely. Hello. Um, I, go ahead, go ahead, Hector. Where did this, stage name Tyler Knight derived from? Good question. Um, so basically it was random. At the time I was looking for domain names <laughs> to correspond with my, my stage name because at the time I had a website and I just picked a random list of first names and a random list of last names and I pretty much mixed and matched them like no taken, 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 taken. Tyler Smith, uh, Derek Knight, Tyler Knight, boom, free. Went with that one. Pretty straightforward. Interesting. Interesting. What's up? Mimi? Yeah, I'm like, that's pretty much, I feel like a lot of people do that, not even just with the porn industry. Anybody just trying to find an artist name for themselves and they don't know. It's like, I don't know what to call myself. So I'm going to refer to the good old internet. So, yep. <laughs> and, and figure it out. The internet never fails you. Wasn't uh, there a wasn't there a Wu Tang name generator or something like that back in the day? Yes, there was. I should have done that. Yes, there yeah. was. I um, I think that's the same generator that um, what's his name? Uh, Donald the singer, who's also an actor. I can't think of his name. Is oh, Donald Donald right? Glover. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, Donald Don- Glover used to get Child- his uh, Childish Gambino. That's right. Yes, to get his stage name. He used the Wu Tang uh, generator. I was like, I should do that. I don't know if it still exists though. Um, I do want to know, like, uh, about because I'm still curious about like the health measurements that are being taken uh, in the porn industry. So you all get tested. But like you going back to being new in the industry at that time, were there any concerns that you had about health being taken or that were not being taken? When you are a young man, you think you're invincible and nothing that happens to other people can ever happen to you. Um, 
which is obviously wrong. And the simple answer was not really, I wasn't really thinking anything other than, other than uh, maybe I might get, you know, chlamydia or something like that, which you can get a, get a sh couple of pills and it'll clear that up. It's just basically a bacterial infection or whatever. Um, until it actually happened that I got exposed to HIV. So this was in 2004. And there was a production company called TT Boy Productions or, or Vase of Angles. Right. And they would go all over the world, basically, and have sex with girls all over the world, basically do a tour of porn, basically, in Czechoslovakia, Prague, um, Brazil, London, whatever, mm -hmm. um, Ibiza, Spain, does Japan, whatever, film maybe 60 or 70 scenes in 30 days. So you were working a lot. And you would come back to the States with, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 in your pocket. Wow. And I got offered to go to Brazil and I, I declined because my first thought was, well, <laughs> testing protocols are not going to be the same as the States and, and little did I know. Mm -hmm. So a gentleman by the name of Darren James went to, went to Brazil with the crew and he came back and he took his monthly test two weeks early because he's a responsible good dude. He took it earlier than he had to, which was a good thing because it ended up that he tested HIV positive, but not before he ended up working with and infecting a few other people. And one of the people he ended up infecting was a young woman who, whom I had sex with. So I was first generation exposed to HIV. And uh, you, you think the whole contact tracing thing right now with COVID-19 is a mess. It was mm -hmm. disastrous back in the early double aughts when um, people were more concerned about trying to cover their own cover their own butts and uh you know hide things than they were um trying to stop the slow stop or slow spread of something uh but yeah i was exposed to hiv directly it was the longest quarantine of my life um i'm acutely aware of the, the importance of quarantine and um yeah it was a huge shift in perspective and since then there have been three other hiv outbreaks in porn industry of different degrees of severity um, cause you know, people in general take it seriously, but all you need is a few bad actors. who just don't care. We'll try to forge a test or look the other way, whatever. Speaking of like the actors who are trying to forge a test, that kind of goes into my next question about, you know, in corporate industry, you have, you know, HR, does porn have like sort of the HR department or the department, um, basically like HR department. Um, and for people who are trying to forge tests, I can't even think of the word of the, the department that they would basically go to get in trouble. Like who do you all report to or report that sort of stuff to? There is no one, there is no such entity. Hmm. Um, I mean, I can unpack this several different ways, but I'll, I'll, I'll stay on track before I digress. So for years, there's been talk of a union of the adult, of adult film performers, but a union is only as strong as its, as its weakest and most vulnerable members. Right. Um, so I never went anywhere. But yeah, I mean, look, porn talent by and large are seen as expendable. They are no more valuable than this, than this uh, light in front of my face or this microphone or camera or whatever. Um, they're interchangeable. And the fact that what I'm saying might seem a little, a little blunt is, is reflected in right now in 2021, in the middle of the worst COVID, worst uh, disease in a, in, a, in, a, in a century, in the epicenter of that disease in Los Angeles, People are performing porn on three-day COVID tests. No quarantine before, no quarantine after, like nothing's happening. And the producers and directors and studio heads, they had a huddle when COVID was deemed to be a real threat to the industry. And the huddle wasn't basically, well, how do we protect our talent? It's how do we protect ourselves from getting sued if talent gets sick and or dies on our set? Uh, we have producers, Correct, correction, we have directors who don't even step foot on set who direct their porn movies from Skype or Zoom. 
in the safe comfort of their own home without risking themselves. Meanwhile, the performers and talents are the ones that are taking, and the crew, by the way, are yeah. taking the brunt of all the all the uh, risk. I mean, look, since the beginning of time, it has always been the people at the wrong end of the power imbalance of any labor industry that assumes the greatest amount of risk to make a product, widget, service, whatever. And porn is porn is a huge example of that. Right now, in real time, is happening. Um, I haven't actually retired per se. I just refuse to step on set and I haven't stepped on set in 11 months because I'm not an idiot. Um, but I, maybe that's a little bit too harsh because there are plenty of people who, you know, maybe they don't have savings. Like I saved, I had the benefit of working 18 years and saving a lot of money in case something like this happened. Mm -hmm. There are young people who don't have the benefit of falling back on savings and they have black holes on the resume because they did porn and how are they going to pay their rent or their mortgage or whatever. So I'm not really judging the talent per se. So it was a little harsh when I said, because I'm not stupid. Um, it's more of a commentary on the people that are on the other side of the power balance that don't provide protocols. And there are exceptions. I mean, there's guys like Axel Braun who won like best director, you know, a gazillion times for his, for his films uh, that not only is he the only condom mandatory director in the entire industry, to my knowledge. Uh, he does not allow performers to work on set unless they have a one day test and he quarantines them before and after. And now he's not even shooting at all. And so this yeah. blows over. So he's, he's a singularity in this business. So yeah, that's a long winded way of saying that uh, there is no union. If you do porn, um, abandon hall, hope who all ye who enter here in porn Valley, basically. Hmm. Interesting. It's very interesting. Let me ask you this. I had an interview. I don't know who I, re I don't know where I got this quote from, but um, between Mr. Marcus, Rome Major, and Prince Joshua, um, they mentioned about while filming, you are given a certain amount of time to be in one sex position, and then you switch to another one. And if that's the case, my question to you would be, does that take away the pleasure of having sex with or intercourse with the woman? Um, do you look at it as a job? Do you, in, in this, in mo is there moments where you enjoy the intercourse while you're doing your job? You know, cause it's like, give the X amount of direction here, there, do this, do that. How do you, can you explain that? Hmm. So that requires a couple different answers. So first of all, I don't work with directors who micromanage mm -hmm. uh, because with anything, whether it's, whether it's, a porn scene or a dialogue scene between Glenn Close and, Mike, uh, and Michael Douglas in Fatal Attraction. Uh, you, you, give your, you give your performance instruction, you let them do their thing, and then you evaluate afterwards. So you make adjustments afterwards uh, between takes, whatever. Uh, the whole voice of God saying, do this, do that, move your leg or whatever. You hire people whom you trust to be competent at their job, and you shut the hell up and you let them do their job. Um, which, my opinion, doesn't make me very popular with a lot of directors, which, which is fine with me. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's a job. I don't go into it thinking about pleasure for me or anything like that. I mean, that's, those are all physical and biological functions in my mind. I am my own director in my mind. I've, I have my own internal, internal monologue, um, about making sure that the, the female town's positioned the right way. That's most flattering to her, uh, that hides any, you know, cellulite or whatever things like that making sure that i'm opened up in position so that the camera can see the action what's going on mm -hmm. um and i have an internal clock that i've done this easily a thousand times that i have an internal clock that i just can tell when they have enough footage in one position or another and i might switch i might be you know in missionary for maybe 30 seconds or 45 seconds whatever and i might switch into something else but I'll always come back and make sure they get their requisite three and a half minutes or whatever it is you know, so that it can be edited together. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's a job first and foremost. I never lose sight of that. It mm -hmm. is a very, 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 very occurrence where you are able to completely lose yourself in the moment and be connected hundred percent. When I say you, I, I should speak for myself because uh, I always have that, that little person sitting on my shoulder um, making sure that it's, it's, uh, you know, c consumable. It's not for me. It's for the consumer at home. 
Um, one of my questions I'd like to ask you too. Sorry, Mimi. Um, okay. Okay. Go ahead. One of the questions I want to ask you is, um, have you remained in contact with Darren James after the exposure or, you know, who you been, who have you been really cool with, you know, in the porn business that y'all still became friends and stuff like that? So that was 2004. So that was what, six, 17 years ago, almost. Wow. Mm -hmm. I saw him once and that was when I was, um, taking a walk i live in silver lake so i was taking a walk one of the bordering bordering townships of uh, east la and he was ironically he was uh in a mobile hiv testing van basically giving out condoms and giving people rapid hiv tests giving back to the community he's a good man mm -hmm. i like the fact that he took something that was horrible and negative that happened to him and he's becoming an advocate uh to help other people so i, I have a high degree of respect for him for that yeah and that was probably 2000, 2008 or 2009, something like that. Okay. All right. Amy? Um, is there something cliche about the industry that, you know, the rest of the world thinks uh, that has actually proven to be true? You know, how people have their own opinions and they prejudge. Do you feel like there is something that is actually proven to be true that's generally cliche about the industry? Yeah, the industry went through several phases and periods. Uh, so there was the, 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 and I'll, I'll talk about monitors. So I'll go from like 70s on up. Um, so there was a period where it was actually on film and it was, and porn films were shown at the movie theaters, just like, you know, you used to have Jaws in one, one, one movie theater and um, mm -hmm. the green door would be at another one, you know? Yeah. And then you had the quote unquote golden era in the 90s where, you know, people like Jenna Jameson were actually household names that became stars, like the contract system. And I came in just at the end of that in 2002. Um, and the industry was run largely by organized crime. So that was definitely true. Now mm -hmm. the industry is far more corporate. Um, and it's actually owned by maybe a handful of companies control 80% of the business. And it's completely different from what you would think it is. It's all about profit and loss, loss, metrics and numbers. And it's much, much, much more corporate. It's run like a business instead of, you know, basically <laughs> a money laundering operation for God knows what. Mm, yeah, that's excellent. That's surprising to me because I would have never thought that it was more corporate now. Um, and I didn't want to give into like the negative stereotypes of like the industry being a mob ru uh, run industry. So I didn't want to think that's why I asked that question. Well, it definitely was up until a decade and a half ago. Uh, so there's a company called, well, they were called Manwin. Now they call themselves Mind Geek. And they own probably half the studios and half the tube sites on the internet. Um, you know, I'm not going to name it because I don't want to give them any 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 free advertising because they're the reason why a lot of us aren't making money because no one pays for porn when you can go online and get the stuff for free. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't matter what business. If you don't have people willing to pay for your business or service, you're not going to make money. But yeah, one company, one entity owns half the studios and the majority of the tube sites. Hmm. All right. Uh, go ahead, Hector. Um, before finding Miss Tyler Knight, was it hard to date or be in a relationship knowing that they knew about your profession? Not at all. I've been with the same person for 19 years, longer than I've been in the adult film industry. And that one person is not my wife. So, I mean, look, we, we approached like a business. Um, it's not me trying to have a tour, a, a sex tour across the world with different women and different backgrounds. And, you know, the occasional celebrity who wants to use your services for a night or anything like that. It's a business. I came in with a set idea of how much money I wanted to make, where I wanted to take my career. And uh, she, she balanced my books. And, um, Without her support, I probably would be a, a, a emotional, mental mess right now. Because it's not it's not a normal existence. I mean, it's 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 a David Lynchian, Federico Federico Fellini esque existence. 
that is so far from normal life. It, I can't even begin to, to, to equate it. So she's, she's my rock. She's my bastion of normality. And I'm very grateful for her for that. That's what's up. Speaking of relationships, Valentine's Day is coming up. What is the ideal romantic date with Tyler Knight for a woman? Well, I'll, I'll answer it this way. I mean, look, the most romantic date with, with anybody isn't giving them a, you know, a, a brown lump of high fat, high sugar chocolate or, or anything. It's your time. I mean, look, time is the most precious thing that any of us has. We, we know, we, none of us knows how much time we get. And the most valuable gift to say that you are important to me, that I care about you or that I love you is sharing the one commodity I can ever get back, my time with you. So not you, Hector, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know what you meant. <laughs> but yeah. uh, speaking of which, now nah, I'm going I'm to crack this down. Um, All right. You had a, oh, I worked in the adult stores in Chicago and Indiana. I was traveled back and forth on, during my undergraduate days. And I remember, I think I was close to leaving, um, quitting the job. And I remember truck pulled over a box, brought it into the um, adult store. And I remember the owner gave me the receipt and it said it was a, a Tyler Knight doll. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so my question to you was, were you pleased with that replica? Because she, I believe she told me that, I don't know what the story was, but she told me to a degree that I don't think you were pleased with it at all. No. And so, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, it was, uh, so there were, there were actually a couple things. There was uh, one product, which I can't remember. That's how memorable it was, obviously. Um, there was the vibrating dildo, which they molded me in plaster and, you know, made a, a vibrating dildo. And you're talking about the blow-up doll, the infamous blow-up yeah. doll. Yeah. It's basically a balloon. Uh, it's a balloon with my face painted on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been <laughs> it's been interesting to read reviews on Amazon.com. Um, yeah, people <laughs> actually tried to use it because the penis is inflatable too. And one <laughs> one one reviewer, one reviewer, <laughs> yeah, just let that sink in. <laughs> Uh, One of you were complaining that uh, right. the, the, the seams cut or cut her insides. Well, no. duh, it's a balloon. <laughs> Another reviewer complained that uh, the, the penises stay up and hard because it's a balloon. It, balloons aren't hard by nature. Um, <laughs> I've, I've heard everything, man. It's crazy. So my, thing to you, so my thing to you is this. I mean, who came up with this idea? And, <laughs> and did they run it by you? I mean, that was the whole thing. Because I, I wouldn't agree to that shit. You know, I'm just being honest, you know, and I wouldn't do that. I mean, you know, <sighs> I, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where it's one of those things where you get offered a contract with a decent amount of money, but, mm -hmm. uh, when you get a contract with a decent amount of money, you sign away creative control and, uh, yeah, so there you have it. Oh. So I didn't have, uh, I didn't have any input or any say, basically what it was, it's a balloon. And they spray painted six pack, pick, pack abs on it, and they screen printed my face on it. Um, that was that was effectively that was effectively it. Um, but there's the crazy thing. So this thing is it's made of PVC, a P, PVA, poly, whatever, polyvinyl acetate or whatever. Those mm -hmm. things decompose extremely slowly. Um, so they have a half life, I believe, of six thousand years. So in the year 8,100. Um, if aliens were to land on Earth and like ex excavate the excavate humanity, this doll would still be there. It might it might actually last longer than the Empire State Building. Um, and this is what far this is what aliens would think that uh, human life was like in, in the <laughs> probably. <laughs> so yeah. Oh my god. I feel bad for the lady who got her insides cut. Like, girl, what were you doing? <laughs> what were you we, know exactly, we know exactly what she was doing, but what was she thinking? <laughs> right. Like, we know she's no, that's what I mean. What were you doing? Go to the hospital. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, so I do want to know what um 
what's keeping you in the industry knowing like all that's going on uh, right now the good the bad what's something or what's the is there one specific thing that's keeping you in the industry or is it a totality of things uh i mean i guess i'll put it i guess uh, i guess i'll put it this way so i i don't need the money I diversified myself in other ways so I don't necessarily depend on the adult industry, obviously by the fact that uh, <laughs> I haven't stepped a foot on set in, you know, 11 months. Um, the only thing I suppose is the fact that maybe there might be, there may be, you know what, I guess I should say this, I guess technically I'm not in the industry. I mean, because really I haven't performed in over a year, almost a year rather. And um, I really can't say with with uh, with any degree of seriousness that I'm still in the industry. Really, I mean, if you're not performing, if you're not doing the thing, are you part of the thing? You know, and I guess the answer would have to be no. I mean, I haven't necessarily uh, announced a retirement or anything like that because, frankly, that's you know self-serving and no one really cares. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know. I just haven't, I haven't performed and I really don't see a scenario which I will perform anytime soon. I mean, short of me getting a vaccination that's proven to be safe and effective, mm -hmm. safe being a very important part of the equation, there's really no scenario which you can get me to step foot on set ever again. And knowing how botched the adult film industry handles other health issues, I can't imagine that day coming anytime soon, so. Okay, Hector. When you started, when, when you became the um, adult entertainer, how, how, what was your family's reaction to that? How did they find out about it? Well, the nice part of uh, starting when you're in your early 30s, you're, you're a grown adult. And, you know, while family is important, they certainly don't have the sway over, over, over you that you would if you were like, say, I don't know, 18 or 19, which is the legal minimum to be in the business, which I frankly think it should be like 25 because that's a different conversation altogether. But uh, 18 or 19 is way too young to make decisions that could affect the rest of your life. Uh, but that's a digression. Um, but yeah, I mean, no one talks about it really. I mean, my father's side of the family, we, you know, we aren't necessarily close to say the least. So it's a non-issue. And the only person on my mother's side of the family whom I'm really close with is my mother itself. So she loves me no matter what, because she has to, she's my mom. It's the law. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's the law. <laughs> I mean, look, no matter what you do, I mean, the, 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 the twin part of that question is what, what, how would I take it if I had children who wanted to be in the industry? Well, okay. I'll tell them no, not because of any moral or moral or relativistic or judgmental standpoint. It's simply because the industry eats its young. And you won't be treated well, and it'll limit opportunities later on in life. So it's a practical matter, not a not a moral judgment or anything like that. But if I had a child who wanted to be in the industry or anything, as long as it's legal and not hurting anyone, be the best you can be. Be the best damn porn person or whatever you set your heart out to be. Be excellent. Every profession, regardless of what it is, has nobility and dignity if it's performed at a high level. I um, mean, you owe it to yourself to be the best you can be at any profession you choose. Because again, just going back to the same thing I keep seeing over and over again, life is short, time is very short. You never know how much time you have. Strive for excellence or don't bother. Hey, that's the model. That's the model. Did performing, in, did performing conflict with any of your religious beliefs? No, not at all. Uh, I mean, look, I had a little, I had a little bit of a freak out when I lost my virginity because I was uh, raised in a, in a very evangelistic household and, you know, <laughs> out of sex, out of wedlock is basically a, a, a grease, a gr grease in the skids to go straight to hell. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I, I lost my virginity. I was, I was 13, I think, 12 or 13. I can't remember. Anyway, that's way too young for, for anyone to have to deal with, you know, going to hell or what if I got a disease or what if she got pregnant or whatever, you know? Um, but after that, after I realized that the gates of hell didn't open up beneath my feet and, you know, Satan didn't drag me in, I 
you know, didn't really affect me. So I'll, I'll be clear. I, I, I do believe in God. I, I, I do believe in, in, I do believe in the commandments that Moses came down from Mount Sinai and, and uh, the Christian, Christian ideology. Um, but I personally think it's ridiculous that, that you should limit the quality of your life based on, based on what other people's versions of their religions are. I mean, heck, if, if you want to break it down even further, there are some religions that would stone uh, most American women to death because they don't cover their faces walking down the street. So, because that's highly erotic or arousing or tempting or whatever. So, you know, who's to say, you know? Um, Mimi? Um, do you feel like there's still more to tell like in reference to your book do you, uh did you leave out anything or was there something else that you could tell about the industry or about your experience overall that was in the book uh no i mean when you write a book or record a song or shoot a film or any kind of art it's a snapshot in time so it's an it's an accurate reflection of who i was as a, as a human being at that time and my experience in the adult film industry at that time so there's really nothing I'd like to add or edit or change. Um, I was very, very blunt. And I did not shy away from calling people out or telling things as they were or calling things or, you know, calling it as I, as I saw it at the time, which, you know, affected my career negatively. But guess what? I have a writing career that's an order of magnitude more profitable and, and more successful than my porn career. So what do I care, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there's no, there's nothing I'd love to. I tried to be as honest as, and 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 as honest and direct and forthcoming as I was with showing flaws of other people in the industry. I tried to be very careful about pointing the lens at myself, so to speak, and showing the flaws and and things that are less than savory and desirable about myself because I'm a deeply flawed person. We all are. Um, and look, anyone who writes a memoir, they're, they're, they're not going to be objective. And you can't be a completely objective writing your own story. It's impossible. I mean, you need some degree of detachment to be able to see things with clarity. Uh, but that said, I did the best I could to show my flaws and, and uh, my poor decisions and situations where I might have hurt other people, sometimes intentionally, to get ahead. Things uh -huh. I might not necessarily be proud of. Um. Current, you can answer the question like currently and pre-COVID, what was the morale or what is the morale of the industry, like in your opinion? So I don't think that there's necessarily any consensus per se. You have people that come from all, all different points of view and different needs. The thing that unites and, and, and pretty much the through line for everybody is everyone who is still active in industry, they're, they're, the only reason anyone would take such an extreme risk of putting their lives on the line and then going home and affecting and putting their loved ones' lives on the line and risking killing people they love is because of money. Let's be, let's be honest. That's the only reason anyone would do it. Um, it's just, this goes beyond a casual hookup. Uh, there is no safe way to socially distance yourself while you are having sex with someone. It just does not exist. Um, so the morale is pretty much a false sense. Uh, you're deluding yourself that you're picking up a gun and pointing it to your head and spinning the chamber and that, you know, the, it's not going to click on, click on it, click on a full chamber. So it's, um, that's pretty much, that's pretty much true. I mean, you have young people who flat out don't think it will happen no matter what, and they just don't care. Um, and you have other people who are flat out desperate and they are completely cognizant of the dangers and risks, but they're put in a situation where again, black hole in their resume, they can't go out and get a real job. And even if they could, what job? Because by the way, we're in the middle of a recession with 20 million people unemployed. So, you know, you're screwed, you know? It's better. It, this is a better risk than this. This is a calculated risk. It's a better calculated risk of uh, of this than than for sure getting evicted or foreclosed on or starving to death or whatever. So I have a hard time really judging the talent. What I really do judge is I judge the studios again, beat the same drum for not having the safe, secure protocols intact and in place that uh, minimizes risk. 
three days is a joke. I mean, look, I could, I could get a COVID test right now. COVID test is a snapshot in time. I can mm-hmm. get a COVID test right now. And between this moment in time right now, I could go out and go around licking every doorknob in down, downtown Los Angeles, right? And my test could come back negative tomorrow, but I still have two days to perform on a porn set um, with a piece of paper that says that I'm negative for COVID-19, whereas in fact, I might've contracted it between any, any, at any point in time amongst those three days. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 it's idiotic and the studios know this and they're not subsidizing talent to pay for the tests, um, which again, they're the ones that are making all the money or most the vast lion's share of the money. They're not subsidizing talent. Um, so it was a balance between how can we get people to test as much as possible while still having to be able to earn a living because the tests are not cheap. Mm. They're like they're like ninety bucks, whatever. Mm. Um, so testing every single day. Can you imagine having to pay a hundred dollars a day to work? No. no. On top of your on top of your uh, bi monthly HIV full panel STD tests. So you know that's that's you know every three days if you're an actor performer, there's thirty days in a month. You know. It's a thousand dollars a month just in COVID tests. Wow. Not including the HIV tests. So that's what? 200, 400. So that's 14, 1500 dollars a month just for the privilege of working, which studios are not uh, not uh, subsidizing any way, shape, or form. So instead of that, they said, okay, we'll make it every every three days. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Stu- studios should subsidize it. It should be daily. And the talent should not have to pony up thirteen, fourteen, fifteen hundred dollars for the privilege of working when the studios, which are making far more money, uh, because they retain all the rights and every, all the distribution rights, all and everything, are not uh, not subsidizing at all. Mm. That's kind of like what uh, Tyler Perry did for that one movie with uh, John David Washington, where. They did it in a secluded area. He did the testing every day, I believe. Yeah. Uh, and that's how it should have been done. Yeah, he's a, he's a good man. And look, talking about mainstream television and film, um, you're not seeing people filming love scenes or fight scenes or anything that requires physical contact in mainstream film. Um, you didn't see that at all over the summer because they flat out stopped because it was idiotic and they had the money. Mm-hmm. Um, now maybe they're starting slowly but surely, but it's under extremely controlled circumstances. And you heard about Tom Cruise last month, who lost mm-hmm. his shit because uh, you know members of the crew weren't weren't uh, were huddling around a, a monitor in Video Village, and not socially distancing. Right. Um, there should be there should be a Tom Cruise in the adult film industry losing their shit over over lack of protocol and safety. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, where did the title Burn My Shadow derive from? That's a very interesting title for a book. Uh, so it was, so there was, um, it's basically lyrics of a song. It was, it's a, it was a song called Tribute to Horace. Uh, Horace Handy, who was part of Massive Attack, which is a trip hop group back in the uh, 90s. I think they're still around. And it was basically uh, a chorus, which that phrase was was uh, in the song called Tribute to Horace. It turns out another group, after another musical act afterwards called Uncle, um, right as my book got published, <laughs> they had a song called Burn My Shuttle also. So it's got, that's actually a coincidence. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, but yeah, just the, 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 the significance and the, and, the, and the symbology of that is, I'll, I'll let the I'll let the re- reader decide for themselves what that means personally because I think it's obnoxious when an artist tells tells someone how they should interpret their work. You do your work, you put it out in the world. You let the person who reads it, um, from the from the title all the way to the last word of the end, decide how they want to interpret it and what it means to them. Absolutely. Now your synopsis in your latest book, the issues, man. Um, it seems like you foretold about a pandemic. All right which is now a reality that we are facing. When did you begin to write that book? What inspired you to write science fiction? It is, I was inspired to write science fiction because I originally wrote it as a true 
like as a contemporary current thing. But I was going running up against pushback that it was so fantastical and out of, out there that nobody would believe it was actually possible. Um, <laughs> and uh, surprise, here we are, right? So I started writing the book in 2008, 2009. And basically it was a story about how I can, how I can show, well, I guess I'll, I'll answer it this way. So that the great thing about science fiction is science fiction allows you to comment on contemporary life and contemporary society, the here and now, while offering degree of remove from it so that you don't have to worry about people challenging the credibility because it's science fiction, right? Um, so this was basically uh, a young black man struggling to be a good father uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, which people in the government have their own self-interest in promoting to stay in power in the middle of race wars and, and race rights and, um, and um, when I wrote at the time, when I started writing at the time, people said, well, that's, that's just never going to happen. Fast forward to 2021, here we are. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what have you not done yet, Tyler, in your life that you would like to do so in the long run? Wow. Okay. So I work from like the big stake that you have to cut up into little pieces and, and then the little pieces. So the, the big stake I want to, I want to, I want to try to try to devour is I want to be the first African-American man to summit Mount Everest and come back down to life. Uh -huh. um, so I should, I should say this, the first African-American to summit Mount Everest and come back down to life. And that's the important part. Getting to the summit is not the, not the hard part. It's actually coming back to live to tell the tale was a young woman. Um, and that's, that's freaking amazing. That, that's awesome. Um, so currently there's one other guy who, who publicly stated he's trying it. Uh, he's summited some pretty high, I think he summited Denali, uh, which is in Alaska, which is the highest point in, uh, in uh, North America. So he doesn't know it right now. He will if he ever listens to this, but we're in a race. Uh, so that's... <laughs> So that's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it requires a lot of work and lots and lots and lots of planning. You can be some rich guy, some millionaire who pays like $120,000 to have like Sherpas, which are the indigenous people to basically schlep your gear up the mountain and basically carry you up the mountain and carry you back down again. Mm -hmm. um, people that are, have no baseline of fitness, no mountaineering experience whatsoever. And that's incredibly dangerous and irresponsible, not just to yourself, but to the people in your team and to the people whom, whom you've hired to help you. Uh, the fatality rates will never speak for themselves. Um, so basically what I'm doing is I'm making sure that I'm gonna be in peak physical condition and have real Alpine mountaineer experience before I do it, before I even attempt it. Um, so before the pandemic hit, I was set to make a little trip to, to Alaska and try Denali. Um, compared to Everest, it's a lot cheaper. It's only, only it's only nine thousand um, dollars, where Everest is six figures. Um, so that's you know that's much more attainable goal, and it's technically more difficult climb than Everest. Um, but, but um, yeah, that that's something that my bona fides would be there if I were to decide Everest uh, would be something I'd be up to. Then I could do it with good conscience and not put my life in danger, the the Sherpa's lives in danger, the other people in danger. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's, that's one big goal. Oh, that uh, sounds good, man. Another goal is I am not ready to announce anything specific, but there are a lot of projects I have in film entertainment for television and film, which I have in the pipeline, which are, you know, in various degrees of coming to fruition. Um, you know, with Hollywood, you, 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 anything until you're actually on set and actually the camera's rolling, anything can kill a project. Actually, even while you're on set and filming, something can kill the project. So it's not something, these aren't things I'm, I feel comfortable talking about or putting out there until, until yeah. it's actually done. But, that's you know, that's, that's where I'm pivoting and focusing on right now. Okay. Reading as broad an audience as possible with uh, television and film. Any more literary works than you? Uh, yeah, so I'm writing screenplays. And okay. that dovetails back into that, that circles back to what I just said. 
Um, and I have ideas for another novel, which, you know, I don't want to talk about until it's actually done. Mm -hmm. Do you think that um, Dear Shoot Man could be a, a possible screenplay? Yeah, it's, um, I think it's a little bit too close to home right now that people, people go to see television and film to escape their current situation and circumstance. So I think seeing the, what the world has devolved into mass chaos and death and government manipulation and political leaders lying and, and uh, middle, military junta, which <laughs> this, is, this is the funniest thing. So the thing I got pushed back from the most, which was uh, deemed as the most unrealistic was that the United States government would take over the United, I'm sorry, the United States military would take over the government and a military junta after a vote of no confidence in the president which it's now coming out that that almost happened. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I am Nostradamus, whatever. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, it's a little bit too close on. People want to see things that, 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 that uh, allow them to escape. I mean, look, when did musicals come out? Remember the golden age of musicals, everything from uh, The Wizard of Oz to, to Singing in the Rain to The Sound of Music? That was right after, uh, right around World War II, you know, when people were basically... Uh, shell shocked of what of what evils the world could produce. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see mm -hmm. a lot more, a lot more, a lot more things in entertainment that are much more unifying and family friendly as opposed to dark stuff. Maybe years from now, I think, I think it might be possible, but now I think it's too soon. Mm -hmm. Okay, Tyler, we're almost at um, an hour, so um, maybe you got one more question or no. Um... I think you guys covered a lot of the just general questions, especially about um, like any works that you have coming up, but you say you don't want to talk about those. So I get that. Definitely get not uh, wanting to talk about anything until it's actually finished. <laughs> then yeah. like, that's when you know it's real. Exactly. So. Well, Todd, I got one last question for you. Um, since we are a podcast that features entertainment and education, um, is a must that I ask, I ask everybody this question. Um, what will be the definitive playlist for you as an adult entertainer? And what will be the definitive playlist for you as an author? So I listen to a lot of uh, a lot of uh, public enemy, even to this day. And, uh, you know, fear of a black planet. Uh, that was, that was, that's uh, that whole, that whole album, you know, that that's what's up right there. You know, a lot of Rakim, a lot of old school Jay-Z, you know, um, can I live, you know, that's one of my favorite songs ever, you know, I'd rather die, nor I'd rather die Norman, I'd rather die Norman's and live dormant, you know, that's how we want it. You know, Jay-Z said it well. Take chances, swing big. Again, we have one go around in this life and uh, make your mark. Rather die enormous and live dormant. And uh, just everyday life, uh, I listen to a lot of Miles Davis, Ella Fitzgerald, Chet Baker, you know, Charlie Mingus, you know. Interesting. Stuff like that, you know. That's what's so, That's what's so. Good music. Yeah. Absolutely. Good music, yeah. Absolutely. Good choices. Ladies and gentlemen, Tyler Knight. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate Sound it. No, thank you. <laughs> thank you. It's a pleasure and an thank honor, you. man. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, chatting with us. I appreciate it. Learned a lot. Learned a lot about the industry. I really did. Just curious about a lot of the things, but got those answered. Nice to make your acquaintance, Hector and Mimi. Be well and be you safe. Too. You, too, you do the same.